So good morning, everyone. Joining you today are Emily Rice Snyder and William Metzinger, this year's hosts of the Into the Dark Room podcast. On our show, we bring on a guest to discuss the arts and gain a new perspective on what it's like outside of the school curriculum. Joining us this morning is Lonnie Graham. Lonnie is an artist, photographer, and cultural activist whose work addresses the integral role of the artist in society and seeks to reestablish artists as creative problem solvers. He is additionally a Pew Fellow and a Professor of Art in Photography at Pennsylvania State University. Thank you for joining us today. It's good to be here. Thank you <laughs> for inviting me. We're glad to have you. All right. So first question right off the bat that we'll roll into, uh, as being a activist and being very proactive with the public and trying to uh, see how you can work with your art. At what point in your artistic career did you sense a calling to cultural activism? It was, in a way, it was a kind of an evolution, but in another way, it, it was kind of incremental in that whenever, I believe it was in 1986 or 1987, I returned from, I returned to the East from California. I started to volunteer at a place in Pittsburgh called the Manchester Craftsman's Guild. There were other, you know, there was, it was a, it was an after-school program at that time. And they had young people from a couple of local schools, I think Oliver High School. And I worked with them and understood that, you know, they were interested in, you know, learning how to do art and photography and that kind of thing. So it wasn't until really, and I guess this sort of comes out in the TED Talk, it wasn't until later that I was working with one of the students and the project that he was involved in really was more of a mapping project and had so little to do with him and his personal views or personal desire to communicate, but had everything to do with the way that the community would recognize the art that he was making and how that essentially validated the artwork. It was, it, you know, it was really, it was like the cliche. I mean, really, it was like, you know, this light bulb went on, the curtains parted, I could see, you know, all these sort of cliches that you would have for an epiphany. And I thought, you know, that is exactly what I had been doing wrong for 30 years, you know, sort of embedded in this, you know, kind of Western European notion of the artist. And I had immediately recognized at that point that artwork was traditionally made for and by people of a larger community. So it was really at that point that I started to commit myself to doing work that was accessible, that people could understand, that was relatable, that everybody could, you know, find some part of themselves in it without, you know, this crazy, you know, abstract kind of work that, you know, that was sort of being done and that I'd been trained to do. So, yeah, I wanted to articulate and activate the needs of the community from, from that minute on. When you first started, did it kind of feel like a bit of an awakening or... The first piece I did was a, call, was a piece called uh, Living in a Spirit House because I had been working with the Fabric work Workshop and Museum and thought that I wanted to do a piece that would honor my community and honor my ancestors. So yeah, I did this piece, you know, where I basically built my living room inside the museum. And of course, you know, later Deborah Willis <laughs> saw it and it went to, she was a curating at the time and it went to the Smithsonian Institution. So the reaction was, you know, as one would expect whenever you would see a place that looks like where you grew up. So people looked at it and immediately responded, you know, oh, you know, my, my Aunt Ethel has a, a sofa that looks like that. Oh my goodness. You know, my uncle Derek has a radio like that. So there was something in it for everybody, especially since that I, I, the way that I built the piece, you know, I wanted to assault all the senses, touch, hearing, smell, vision, everything. So it was an immersive experience. Uh, at the Smithsonian, they had to, you know, sort of cordon it off so you couldn't go in and sit down and read the magazines. But at the workshop, the whole idea was to be able to go in and have a complete sensory experience so that nobody was left out so that everybody could be included on some level. If it wasn't, you know, if they didn't completely understand it, you know, they could, you know, they could smell it or, you know, they could see the pictures on the television or, you know, they could, you know, relate to, to the way that the room was set up. So yeah, that was, that was that. Were you ever interested in creating art, like art and art pieces that didn't somehow service a community or others in some way? Or was it that like, 
helpful like servicing aspect that kind of drew you to the arts? No, at, at first, um, well, the, the first, you know, piece I did, I guess, my sort of first act of social activism, I guess happened, as I explained a little bit earlier, uh, when I was meeting with other students, was, I think, for or five year old. And, but then, you know, training as you become trained and people, you know, the traditional methods that they use to train young students is from, you know, what people know, what, you know, my, what my teachers knew was to help me understand how artwork was done in, in their tradition. So, you know, I was being trained like a Western European artist, you know, and learning to appreciate, you know, Caravaggio and Da Vinci and, you know, all of those van van eyck and that kind of stuff so but you know i still had a profound appreciation of uh you know franz klein and mark rothko and you know jacques david and these you know traditional even the, the abstract expressionists so i mean i i understood pollock and you know, all of these kinds of things it affected me very deeply so it was those that kind of work I aspired to and that's what the kind of work that I did I you know I did that kind of traditional photography where I believed that art was visual communication of a particular human experience I wanted to establish metaphors for the way that I was thinking and feeling so that other people could you know hopefully access the work at some kind of emotional or intellectual level but still you know, what I didn't understand was that that work was still very exclusive to a large portion of the population of people that didn't understand the arts and they don't understand artists. And, you know, we were a marginalized com and still are a marginalized community and are are othered. You know, we're stereotyped by by the community at large. We're put into a different class. So what happens now is, you know, I, I'm really sort of committed to trying to get people to understand the value of the arts and, you know, and how, and it's a, it's a tough, it's kind of a tough road with artists because they like doing what they do. But I'm just trying to, I'm talking about a more inclusive way to view the arts, to cultivate an audience that under, at least can have a conversation about the arts, to help artists understand their role as problem solvers, right? Because traditionally, if we look at ancient cultures, the artists are there. We're, you know, we're addressing deities, we're making buildings, we're, you know, we're making clothes, we're, we're making bowls that we can use, you know, with utility. We're building houses, we're, you know, we're making money. To, that people can use as currency. So that, yeah, I mean, I started out and I, I love the kind of, you know, traditional European methods, but at the same time, I, I think people appreciate the arts whenever it has some degree of utility to the point where they appreciate them so much that they don't even call it art. They call it design. They call it ceramics. They call it architecture. They call it something artists are put into a whole different class until it's something that they want. And then they name it. <laughs> they name it something else. <laughs> but yeah, I think that answers your question. <laughs> Trying to uh, navigate what you were talking about, about classism and uh, artists being placed in a uh, kind of their own group, even though it might be subconscious. Have you run into any friction on trying to show people that the art is there? Uh, have you have run into people that just simply don't agree? Yes, I. Well, a couple of things. Yeah, I. Whenever I give the lectures, you know, many times, you know, some artists just, you know, they yell and scream and tell me I'm crazy. But the idea is that, you know, this is all, you can do whatever you want. You know, I'm not saying that you, that every artist has to, you know, work with a community. Like that kind of stuff isn't for everybody. Like a lot of people just don't, they don't know how to do that. They don't want to do that. They don't want to include people in their process. And they real, they get vehemently opposed to it. You know, other people think it's sort of curious. Uh, one woman came up to me after a lecture that I gave in Calgary in Canada and she was she was yelling at me so hard we had to stop and you know I had to have a whole separate meeting with her and I did I met her in a cafe the next day and it turns out that she was really a, a remarkable woman and had written like a number of books she was a Brazilian and was involved in another project in Finland and then at the end of the conversation asked me if I wanted to come and do a project in Finland and I said yes so which 
<laughs> so worked out. <laughs> so yeah, she was just not quite understanding that I was, you know, wanting to help people. I think she thought that I was just a regular kind of a bourgeois. Do you think your piece, A Conversation with the World in particular, you've said before you use black and white Polaroids to capture the work. Do you think using that element allows you to get that more personal aspect out of that work? Yeah, being able to, you know, give somebody a gift makes all the difference. You know, I, so in that way, I'm not like actually taking a picture, but I'm sharing the moment and I'm giving an image. I'm giving the, the gift of an image to the person who sat for the photograph. So now the person is a whole lot more included in the process. We have at least some kind of an exchange, you know, even if we can't speak the same language, we're able to come together in a common understanding around this image and around those around those moments that we shared. So if it happens right there at that instant, it works out. It might, you know, on occasion, I've gone back to some of these people's houses. And even though I thought, you know, the f that moment didn't go very well, the photograph will be there in their house, like, in a in a position of sort of reverence so yeah and the people are so different but i i appreciate the polaroid process and you know dr land did a, an amazing thing but yeah i appreciate the polaroid process for the fact that i'm able to to continue to make a gift to the people that are in the photograph now that polaroids are kind of long on their way out what medium or what uh cameras are you using now to make current work if you are making current work well i've always used um you know just any kind of camera that i had at hand so when i was young uh well i used the polaroid and you know up in the 60s and you know the 50s and 60s and then later on in the in the mid 60s you know i had a regular 35 millimeter camera and a friend of mine gave me kind of a two and a quarter elina Feilander gave me a, a two and a quarter square yashica and i used that until i got i started to use the hasselblad and i used those just traditional film cameras and then i came back to the polaroid in the late you know so there was only maybe about 10 years that i wasn't you know working mm -hmm. a lot with the polaroid but now that it's obsolete you know and the film is just obscenely expensive on ebay you know i do i still have a few boxes and i'll if i'm able to go out this summer i'll probably use that up and that'll probably be the end of it and i think there's a commission in the works for me to continue the conversation with the world project uh using digital so i just have to figure out a way to print out the photograph how do you anticipate that you'll approach the project differently like working digitally than you did with film that's kind of yet to be seen uh i really still want to i'll probably be working digitally here in the u.s so that's a whole other kind of an audience but if i do work digitally outside the u.s like i said i really need to figure out a way to print those things out so i just don't i feel guilty not being able to leave something after doing this thing for 30 some years it does, with, doesn't feel the same with working with a conversation with the world how much are you including your subjects in the story and have you had any conversation on what their view of your mission is yeah there's um you know it all depends on the person usually so the way that the, the way that the thing works if i'm going to talk to like either one of you for example there's there are it's a template there's eight questions so you know we go through all of the questions and it's a conversation you know like i'm asking you you know what are your family origins how far back do they go are there any outstanding personalities in your family uh you know what uh, you know what what's your opinion about you know the origins of the universe uh do you see anything around you that relates back to your family traditions, your traditional family practices like architecture or, you know, art or anything like that. And, you know, a you know, couple of other opinions. So through the course of that conversation, you know, we're exchanging ideas. So, you know, they're leaving me with what they're thinking. Uh, one experience that really, sort a couple of really kind of interesting experiences that stand out. Uh, one was when I was on the mosque uh, at Genet on the Niger in Mali. Uh, I was talking to the Imam and had, you know, just answer, asked the questions. And then after the whole thing, we were just sort of sitting there. The sun was coming up in the distance or, you know, just about to the morning prayers. And he said, what, you know, what are you doing? What is, you know, what is this about? And I said, I told him, that the idea was that every single time that I asked the questions, there was a common thread that ran through the answers that would bound the, the course of our humanity and, and our understanding of each other. And that's what I was trying to do. And then he, worthy of 
reverence. So that was really touching. Along the Niger, there, I, I it went out onto the cliffs uh, there in Mali, and I found the troglodytes, um, the Dogon, who still live in the caves, and none of them speak any English. But I was able to, you know, to work and communicate with them, and they took me to you know, one of their sacred areas. And, you know, I was able to communicate with these, with these holy men. And it was, we were able to communicate the, the idea behind the, the purpose of the work. So it's really kind of stunning. It's, it sounds almost spiritual in a way. It's kind of deep. It gets deep at times. That's good though. Uh, which of your locations did you find yourself most attracted to? The landscape itself is always, you know, incredible but the people are usually what stand out in the the people make the experience um and there's no i mean the you know in papua new guinea you know they built they built the house for me to stay in um in kenya you know i sort of became part of part of the family uh uh the koreans the people that i encountered in korea are in, indescribably effusive and generous and open and welcoming and accommodating. So, you know, it's, it's, really, it's really the people. Are there any locations you haven't been able to get to yet that you would be interested in taking this project to? I've always wanted to go to um, Western India, um, to Nagaland. There's, a, there's an interesting mixture of traditional culture and Western culture. And those are the places that I am really interested in. I like to work along the edges of our societies where I can, you know, document these cultures right before they go and disappear into oblivion. You know, I'd like to go into the Amazon to, you know, before all of those cultures are corrupted. So, yeah, all, you know, all those places where, you know, they just have started to accept and understand Western culture. And I just wanted to be there before it just disappears, before their traditional culture just disappears into oblivion. With working on your a conversation with the world, has the project transformed or had any changes since you started teaching as a professor at Penn State? It, yeah, that, you know, that project has, even though they've funded like a couple of expeditions, which I'm very thankful for because of the faculty, you know, it's a research institution and they support re- their faculty research. So, you know, they've funded in part a couple of expeditions into the Illumina Triangle and I think maybe one time into, you know, uh, the Sami. There was a Swedish uh, American Foundation grant and I think Penn State fa- funded part of it as well to go and talk to the people, the nomads that live up above the Ar- Arctic Circle. Um, so, but the the... The, the project itself has evolved since, you know, the, the constant, of course, is that Polaroid film. But technologically speaking, I mean, when I first started, I was using a, a four, you know, a four track tape tape player. And now I use my phone. So, <laughs> yeah. So over 30 years, it's what, from 1985? Yeah, 35 years. Just a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Had you ever intended on becoming a professor? Was that your eventual no. goal? Uh, no. No. <laughs> uh i started teaching very early you know as a teenager when i started to actually teach uh many you know i worked in around the little town that i came from doing workshops i worked at the the ivy school of professional art in pittsburgh where most of the students were older than me um at the san francisco art institute i had the profound privilege of being the teaching assistant to john collier jr who pioneered uh this kind of visual anthropology whenever he went into the amazon and took motion pictures of a lot of the tribes that lived there and larry salton who sadly passed away not long ago um but yeah as i was always teaching somehow but and I, I sort of wanted, knew that I were, if I worked in a university that, you know, I might be able to continue work and to continue research. Uh, but the once I started to do the work in Pittsburgh, working with the after school program, um, that was OK. But, you know, it was it was it was good, you know, because I after that, I worked at Haverford as a professor. Haverford College, but after that sort of stopped because I was then working with Professor uh, Willie Williams, who's an incredible scholar. Um, the Pennsylvania State University called me up on the phone and asked if I wanted to come and teach. And I said sure. So that's how that happened. <laughs> that's how I wound up in Central Pennsylvania. It was a, a generous invitation. Has there been any opportunity to bring? St- 
a student with as you go on one of your trips? Or is that something you would be open to trying? Or... I'm glad you asked that question. There's, um, yes, to answer succinctly, yes. Now, I frequently work with another professor, Linda Connor, and we have workshops or summer classes where, it, and it's through the San Francisco Art Institute. So remembering that the San Francisco Art Institute was established 150 years ago and is the oldest school west of the, the, the oldest art school west of the Mississippi River. So Ans, Ans, one of my mentors, Ansel Adams, started the photography program in the 1940s at the San Francisco Art Institute. So it's a venerable institution. And one of my old professors, and now we're friends, Linda Connor, has these summer travel classes where we'll take you know, 10 or 12 students to where have we been? Peru. We've been to India. We've been to Hawaii. Uh, oh, we went, went to India a couple of times. In Peru, we've been a, a few times. So there have been a half a dozen of these courses. And at the end, there's always a, an exhibition. And usually there's a book. So students that enroll in these classes through the San Francisco Art Institute are, you know, are bound for quite an adventure. So <laughs> to have these two crazy old professors running around the Himalayas <laughs> taking pictures <laughs> <laughs> yeah, getting into mischief. So if anybody wants to do a graduate program at SFAI, then I encourage them to do so. It's possible. I've had students just sort of tag along from Penn State, you know, without necessarily paying the tuition, but they don't get any college credit, but they get, you know, a pretty good ride. <laughs> I bet a heck of an experience for sure. Yeah, yeah. Who knows when we'll get to traveling like that again, but... July. <laughs> is that when your next trip is planned? I've got to go. I've got to, yeah, I got to get this thing done. <laughs> uh, my publisher in Korea, the Dats Press, uh, said that I must be on site in September period. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So thus far, like how has the inability to travel affected both your work and yourself? It's been I'm pretty much the way that I guess, you know, it has affected everybody else. I mean, you know, we can maybe if we're lucky, we can travel, you know, down and get a uh, a bag of groceries. So, you know, sadly, that's that. I mean, at first I was bound to the to the to the to the campus here, to the compound. You know, and I'd go out back into the woods and do some work, you know, out there. But then I got a little I got a little brave and I put on, you know, double masks and I went out to the West Coast and started to do a little work in the Marin Headlands. But I was actually in Florence attending to an exhibition and doing lectures on February 28th, whenever they closed the country. So mm -hmm. I had to jump on the plane and, you know, get back here last year at this time. So it's had, you know, and I was supposed to go on sabbatical last year and, you know, had to cancel all those plans. So I was supposed to work with the Turkana up around the Alimi Triangle and, you know, work with these migrating tribes. And that was curtailed. So from a practical standpoint, it's had a, a very profound impact. You know, spiritually, it's it's kind of, it, it was, it's been a great impediment. So Zoom doesn't quite suffice. It doesn't quite cut out no. the same as in person. No. Well, uh, I just wanted to say that I think it's astounding. Uh, it's really amazing to see how much community work you've been doing along with uh, personal work and making your community work very personal. I think that's worthy of an applause. Uh, not too many not too many artists are uh, thinking that way during their process. Thanks. Um, yeah, no problem. Uh for people who are listening, what might be the easiest way for them to view your work? Oh, boy. This is the problem. The collectors always yell at me because I don't have anything. I'm, I, don't, I don't commodify. So I don't, like, I don't produce you know, objects like the way that many other artists do. Uh, I have MR Lonnie Graham, Mr. Lonnie Graham on the Instagram. You can see you know, landscapes and family photos. I don't have a website, but if you type in my name, there are little examples of work. So, you know, and other links to exhibitions that I've had. But the website is under construction. And uh, I think that a, a woman who lives in central Pennsylvania, around Lancaster, who's finishing, who's done an incredible job 
so far with actually getting work on the internet. But there's still, you know, a little, a few more details that need to be ironed out and then it'll go live. Well, but yeah, if you type in my name, you can see most of what I do. What advice would you give someone also trying to pursue a similar career as yours, trying to create art that's community-based? Listen, you can't do anything without listening and understanding the people that you're working with. In many cases, like in the, the project in Finland, I think that took five, it took five or six years of going and then going back and then going back again the next year. Like the first couple of years, I didn't do anything except just listen to people. I didn't, you know, I didn't use the camera. I didn't take out the microphone or the recorder. I just listened to what they were talking about. So it's not, yeah, any kind of community work or inclusive work has so much less to do with the artist and so much more to do with the community. Ego is the most profound hallucinogen. So you want to be inclusive and you want to listen to people and you don't want to be bound by the parameters of your own imagination. You want to include other people into your process so that you can hear what they're saying and then let their ideas come to life. Well, I think that is excellent advice, uh, especially for us students. We're on our last semester, so we're ready to hit the open road and we're all looking for, <laughs> we're all looking for pathways to follow down. Um, yeah, uh, from me and Emily, we just wanted to say again, uh, I don't know how many times we could say it, but thank you for spending the time to come talk to us. You're welcome. You know, uh, you got my Instagram account. You can get in touch with me. Yes. You know, send an email. I'm happy to chat. No problem. Well, uh, excellent. We hope that you have a fantastic rest of your day and best of luck on the next couple of months of your travels and endeavors. Thank you. Yeah, Thanks. No... I, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to talk with you and share these ideas. No problem. We hope you have a great rest of your day. Okay. So long. Bye-bye. It's very nice to meet you. It was nice to meet you too.